and um, hopefully today will be useful. Um, as Karen said, I'd like to keep it as informal as possible. So if there's anything at all, just shout out and um, we can we can take any questions around like that. Um, so I'll just share a wee quick presentation if that's all right with everybody. Um, and hopefully it will work. So I'm not sure if everybody can see that OK. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Matthew, perfect. So every knows why we're here today, as Karen said. So um I'd maybe just start off with a wee bit, just a wee bit of background. So um my name's Matthew Nevin. I know a, a few of you a few on, on today. Um I'm the Access Inclusion Officer with Fermanagh Noma District Council. And um so today I suppose I want to go through a bit of just about um legislation, which we all probably all familiar with, um, a bit about um why why to make uh, tourism more accessible um, and then a, a few top tips on on various disabilities that that we've had um, highlighted by people with disabilities through our access and inclusion advisory group. So I suppose first of all <clears throat> on as everybody knows under legislation um, we we are legally obliged to make changes and to make our service as accessible as possible but um, I suppose under the Disability Discrimination Act, um, section one of it, it defines what disability is. So um, it's a person who has disability if he or she has physical or mental impairment, which is a substantial um, adverse effect, uh, sorry, a substantial long term adverse effect on his or her ability to carry out normal day to day activities. So under legislation, employers and service providers have duties and obligations um, under equality laws and as to be an, an equal opportunity employer you must not discriminate unlawfully against or harass anybody on the grounds of various section 75 uh, categories but including those with disabilities and those providing goods facilities and services which many of us here today are and um, we are required to make them accessible to everybody and i suppose we are legally obliged to make changes, of course, but I think it's just, I suppose it's also looking at um, just the benefits by making those changes and the benefits to people's uh, lives, their health and well-being, and the amount of services they can actually access. Um, and I suppose um, moving on from that, there's also, I suppose, it also makes good business sense as well. Um, and I know Dermot here is on the call today, and um, I know Dermot has often mentioned this in, in, at our meetings, uh, and that's the, around the Purple Pound. So the Purple Pound refers to spending power of uh, disabled households. And for this, a disabled household is a household in which at least one member of their family uh, has a disability. So organisations we are we are missing out on businesses um, due to poor accessibility or people not being dis disability confident in their customer services approach or um, it may be just they're not aware of what access we actually offer. So just a few figures, I suppose, just to highlight just how much um, I suppose businesses can, can you know could be tapping into and I appreciate this is on a large scale and not maybe, you know, um, talk towards our district, but uh, I suppose we are still a percentage of, of that. So one in five UK customers have a disability. And that, uh, there's actually two billion pounds worth um, of money that is lost uh, on a, a month um, by ignoring the needs of uh, people with disabilities. A 73% of potential dis uh, disabled customers experience barriers on more than a quarter of websites they visited and a wee bit later we look at look at maybe making improvements to websites and then 16 billion pound um is the spending power taking average per head of disabled people um and then 17.1 billion and that is how much online shoppers who click away from accessible websites that's the spending power that they they have so I suppose just for a wee while, um, I'd like to maybe focus on a few top tips for various disabilities. And I suppose just to put a wee bit of context to it, these top tips um, we have consulted with a range of people with various disabilities through one of our ad access advice groups that the council have, and it's made up of volunteers um, with different disabilities and support organisations. 
And they were really keen that they wanted to come up with top tips that are easy to put in place that actually they say make a huge difference when they're going to access services. And I suppose um, these are certainly not, um, these are not just the only issues, but they said that they're the, the top ones um, for maybe businesses and venues don't have to spend huge amounts of money um, to, to bring them up, up to standard. So I suppose the first one is physical disability and I suppose I should have said as well there's a lot of you will see this there's so many of these actually relate between different disabilities Um, so I suppose the first first section we'll take is physical disability and the top tips that, that the members came up with um, were to make people more aware of what access your venue actually offers before and during the visit and um, so <clears throat> I suppose that like the website and um, a lot of people have said you know they maybe aren't aware of where to where to visit um because they're not sure if it has a ramp uh, access um or whether something provides um maybe here in loop that sort of thing so even to have even a, a small section on your website or um, on your social media and um, to regularly maybe post about about what access you actually offer um, and that that would make people more aware um that they can actually visit um and um, even could be maybe repeat customers. And then even during their visit recently, we, we've we held um, a bit of a engagement event with young people with disabilities and, and a couple of members highlighted that they actually, when they're going up the town, they actually try to look out for venues that have maybe a little sticker in the window that, that highlights that they have um, uh, 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 disabled access so that that sticker um with um symbol uh, with or the wheelchair symbol on it and um, so it's even thinking about those things and when i say this today even council venues who are aware that we don't have everything right either so these are things that we are also looking at um so we're certainly not um uh just you know um we're certainly not perfect ourselves so we've got we stuff to work on and I suppose the main, the main thing that they also said was to ensure the main entrance and inside the areas are accessible as possible. And this came in as well, um, or sorry, came up was even the layout of maybe aisles and allowing um, good, good um, or enough space for somebody who maybe has a wheelchair to, to kind of navigate around the aisles. And um, that can be quite off-putting. And I suppose even, I know, th uh, the member of the public who raised this with us said that even to reach out and say, you know, to maybe a long standing customer who has a disability or even somebody that you maybe know to say, do you mind going around at our premise and just tell us what what would you like to see changed or is there any really, really positives here or are there things that we can improve? And they said that, you know, they they are more than happy to do that and um, just to make things uh, better for others as well. And I suppose that we're also aware that if you're in a, a you know an older building, not every area will be accessible, and no matter what, some areas cannot be changed. If there's um old steps and things that might it mightn't be possible to have those the levels for a ramp, and um, so our members said that if that's the case, bring the items down to the person, or if there's something that can be moved down to them, bring it down to them, and also the, I suppose. If that's the situation, don't forget about them and always keep coming back to them. Another thing as well um, was providing seatings, uh, or seating, sorry, at key points or long, long corridors. So um, I suppose it could be somebody who maybe is using crutches or a walking stick that they may need that sort of break um, between long, long walks. So it's maybe thinking about um, if you have a long path or maybe at your entrance or something like that. Um, if there's a bit of a walk from the car parks, it's about maybe thinking about is there maybe a, a chair that someone could take or it could even be if you have a premises, um, it may be even having a seat and beside the, the tail if there was room that somebody could feel that they could sit down um, if they're standing in the queue. So it's just thinking about different things like that. And again, it might not be possible. It depends on the, the space that you have. And the big thing here, I suppose, and this may release a bit of customer service as well, is um, 
speak to the person, not the care friend. And I know one of our members has, you know, has highlighted this so many times that they have actually been out with maybe their sister and the, the, the person and maybe in the street or something has actually spoke and asked. Um, I know that they said before that they were in a, in a um in a house actually it wasn't a business but in a house and the person actually asked the sister does she take sugar and the the member then went on to to write actually a wee drama about it and um, so they they would say you know just speak to, speak to us and ask us that not not the care of the friend we we know the best so i suppose the next um section is dementia and again you'll see that there are some some uh, crossovers with uh, with different disabilities uh, as everybody's probably more than aware of but um i suppose for this um we we linked in with a number of uh, or support organizations and you'll see the the contact details there and um and i will share the slides as well with karen so everybody will have access to these and i suppose as well just to highlight that these organizations can provide advice to businesses as well um on on if you have any questions and they provide um some the likes of training and things as well so um they're a good point of contact as well so for dementia i suppose the top tips um were to find a quiet place um, it may be that the person can uh, you know could be quite busy and um, that that may put them under more pressure so find a quiet space for them maybe for you to go over um what they need to do or whether it's taking their money that sort of thing that they they can relax and don't feel under as much pressure it's also about keeping it simple so maybe not giving them as much options um you know or maybe uh, adding to the information it's maybe just keeping to that one one topic or one task at a time also, I suppose getting att their attention first and maintaining eye contact, um, and I suppose that's important. Um, but it's also, I suppose, we were also then made aware at another session that um, some people with dementia may actually find it hard to maintain eye contact. So it's it's just reading reading the the person and seeing what's what's comfortable with them. I suppose it's also about listening carefully, and it might be that somebody is a bit confused, and um, but it's it's just maybe listening carefully to try and work out what they they may mean, um, and then also if you're relaying information, it's just maybe regularly checking that they understand. So if you're asking them a couple of questions, or you're providing maybe steps, say to to do an activity, it's maybe just checking that they understand at each step. So we've also worked with Headway, the brain injury uh, charity, and they provided us with a few top tips for people who've maybe had an acquired brain injury. And this might be true an accident, or it could be true a stroke, um, or it could be something um, that indeed they were born with. So a few top tips here were the person may tire easily, so they may become fatigued. So even providing regular breaks or an option to break. So if they're, if they're carrying out an activity, or doing a walk or whatever that may be, it's maybe providing them again with that quiet space or providing seats or allowing them to take a step by step if it's if it's at all possible. Again, back to the communication and as you see, clearly uh, links to different disabilities here, but it's about speak, speaking slowly and clearly to allow them to pr a bit more time to process the information that you're letting them know and environment again is for reducing the background noise as far as possible so that maybe it's not as agitating um, as it could be memory again it could be that information needs to be repeated and um, i know members have told us that sometimes the best way and this goes for dementia as well uh, is just providing the written information simply if there's something that maybe needs to be done that to actually just take a pen and paper and, and write it so that they can have that at all times and then they you know they don't feel under pressure that they have to uh, to remember that that they'll have that there to keep uh, remind them I suppose it's important to, re uh, to highlight as well at this stage that some of these disabilities are hidden disabilities. So it may not be obvious to you that somebody has an acquired brain injury. It may not be, um, you may not be able to identify somebody who has a learned disability. So 
sometimes people will have cards or identity cards. Um, I know that um, Headway do have a brain injury identity card. So somebody may produce this to you so that they don't feel like they have to explain and, and at queues in front of other people. So it's maybe making staff aware that people may produce this. Um, and uh, when you get the slides, there is there's some information or there's a link there to get some more information on that card. Um, and I'll talk a wee bit later about some other cards that that could be produced. So learning disability, and again, Mencap helped us, and we have we've um, Joanne who works for Mencap who who keeps us right. Um, with regards to learning disability and, and provides us for lots of lots of advice and guidance that we we need to to uh, implement to make our services better. So um, some of the top tips that Joanne has given us um, is to make information easy to read, and that's including websites and leaflets. Um, so it could be that there's a lot of text uh, in documents. It could be that there's quite a lot of abbreviations. Um, so it's about just using uh, clear language. Um, that maybe sets out the steps. It's about maybe breaking up paragraphs so that it's it's um, maybe um, you know three bullet points rather than one big paragraph. And if you can avoid abbreviations or even maybe uh, words that that people mightn't just uh, get the meaning off straight away, um, if you could break those down and just keep it clear. It's also about discussing one topic or issue at a time, and again, a bit like dementia, it's taking the person to the side if, if it's appropriate and discussing that one topic at a time so that you're not inundating people with, with too much information. A new one here, I suppose, is providing good, clear signage and using icons and pictures, and that could be for the signage, but it could also be for your website or it could be for um, information or posters. Um, so it's about using maybe um, instead of using words, using the pictures or complementing the words with pictures. And again, a big one here is I suppose treating the persons according to their age. So you know somebody with a learning disability could be in their thirties and forties, and they may not appreciate being treated like a child. You know, so they would they would say that it's just kind of reading that, reading them as well, just and and treating them just according to their age. So autism and neurodiversity, um, we actually, I suppose, we are also going to be rolling out some awareness training to organisations as well around neurodiversity, and we're going to have that recorded. So if there's anybody that's interested in, in adapting their information to our, sorry, their services for people with neurodiversity um, or neurodiverse conditions, I link in with Karen um, when we have that up and going later, or, sorry, early next year. And, um, and hopefully that might be of um, interest to a few as well. So Autism NI here have provided us with a number of top tips for, and I suppose um, to highlight here as well, that there's such a wide variety of different, so people will need different things and it may be difficult to just um, hit all them right. So it's, I suppose it's just, just trying and seeing what works best. So the first one here was to clarify expectations. So it's just clearly describing the situation, what will happen and Something that we have used here, and um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, a bit more later on, is social stories. So that's just breaking down the task and what everybody, uh, what everybody will have to do, and like a wee image just to describe it. We'll come back to that. Again, it's about being specific. So it's about not using words and phrases with double meanings. Some people with neurodiverse conditions will take things literally. So if you're using sarcas sarcasm or something like that, they will take that literally, not, um, you know, um, well, some people will, and uh, they might just get that. Um, so it's just being aware of that. So again, using visuals. So it's complimenting, complimenting the written information with pictures, just to explain things. So I'm just even trying to think, um, you know, say if they were doing um, canoeing, it may be just to have that photograph of a canoe um, or a graphic with a canoe and um, that, you know, when they look at the information, they'll pick that straight away rather than have to read, read it out. So 
I suppose with some neurodiverse conditions may be a sensory element. So it may be, you know, worthwhile looking at extreme lighting or sounds in the area. And um, so, and I know sometimes it's not not possible to to adapt um, the lighting and things like that. But it's maybe then in that case warning people before they arrive. So it could be again through the website or social media. Um, and I know a lot of people are considering potentially quiet uh, times now as well. So it might be that maybe once a week, once a month that you actually try to do something with uh, the any background noise um, uh, off and maybe extreme lighting down or providing maybe a quiet space so that people with um, neurodiverse conditions can maybe come along and experience the, the tourism in a different relaxed environment. The, and also another top tip was considering allowing the person to join the front of the queue or um, and I suppose um, true feedback is clear that sometimes people's neurodiverse condition can struggle when it comes to cues and things like that so it it might be that you know if you if you identify um somebody that that maybe is feeling uncomfortable when queuing it might be just kind of very subtly maybe um take them to another side and be able to allow them to process um uh, the the transaction without without being obvious to maybe other customers and things like that. So it's just maybe considering that. So deaf and hard of hearing, so RNIB and deaf blind NI um, and our members who represent those organisations um, give us a number of top tips as well. So again, it was about taking the person to a quieter area. Um, <clears throat> But also when you're doing that, it's about always facing them and looking at the person. Um, and I suppose um, when I first started the job, I would have a habit of maybe covering my face and put my mouth over my, my mouth, or sorry, my hand over my mouth. And I suppose if somebody is lip reading, they cannot read the, the lip. And it, I suppose it was the same with COVID with masks. It, it was it was difficult for them to lip read. So it's just always uh, been aware. And I know um, one of our member highlighted that sometimes when people are working at computers, maybe at, at, a, at a reception area, they might turn away to do something um, and ask questions and the person can't pick up what they're saying. So it's about just making maybe staff aware that that um, always keep you know, if you're going to ask a question or deal with somebody to keep looking, looking up. Um, and again, um, it's just about speaking normally um, as well. So it's not about shouting because I know um, a member of ours did highlight that that does happen quite often and it makes them feel very conscious that other people, you know, um, other people may look over then when the person's shouting at them and things like that. So it's just about speaking normally as you would. And if the per the person themselves may ask you to speak up, you know, so um, it's just been a bit sensitive um, to their needs. Another big thing was hearing loop systems. Uh, the I suppose, um, probably, um, every may be more familiar with the portable hearing loop systems. So the small box, um, usually used for small areas, maybe reception areas and things like that. So it's just being aware if 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 you have them that staff um know how to use them and that regularly check them that they're actually working. And again, it's about the pen and paper. Sometimes, so it's if somebody does come in, you know who who's who's deaf, um, it it the easiest thing to do potentially could be even just to communicate through pen and paper. Um, so it's just being aware of that that if you do come into into maybe a problem that that's that's also an alternative way to communicate. So blind and visually impaired. So if a person is blind or visually impaired, um, there's a couple of top tips here that, that people may wish to consider. So it's asking if the person needs assistance and then waiting for them to accept your offer. And this came up the other day in another um, session we were doing. And I suppose it's just some people are, you know, are independent. They do not need assistance. So to just assume um, isn't right either. So it is just about asking politely if, if somebody needs uh, help and, you know, waiting just for them to accept. And if they need it, they'll definitely, definitely, uh, you know, ask you to step in. 
I suppose it's also about keeping the areas tidy and making people aware of any permanent obstacles there may be. So I suppose if you think somebody with maybe a, um, who has a sight loss, you know, if if you have something, um, I'm just thinking, maybe um, a white pillar in the middle of you know uh, your reception um and the the other walls are white you know it may be for, difficult for them to to actually see that so it's maybe just about by sticking up a poster um that that people will clearly identify it or it's about making people aware of it um if if you realize that somebody is, has uh, has sight loss um and then some people will maybe ask people to guide guide them around the the venue um and if that is the case, um, they will take your arm um, and you, you um, walk slightly in front of them. And then it's just about describing the route ahead. Um, so it might be, for instance, if they had to leave again, it may be telling them, you know, we'll be coming to a set of doors in three steps. Uh, the door opens outways, uh, outways, and then there's three steps down, um, and it's just you know making people aware and describing the situation. And then again, make sure that online information can be easily read. Um, so there's there's different settings now through computers and things and magnifying software and screen readers. So it's maybe just checking to see if website, um, if your website, um, actually complies with these. And then again, the area of assistance dogs. Um, and here I know we've uh, noted gay dogs here, but I suppose it's just remember that they are professional dogs at the end of the day. Um, and it's just not to pat uh, a pet um talk or play play or feed the dogs um at all. Um, and you know. Eh, you, the, their owner um, may, you know, if, uh, at some stage say it is OK, you know, if, the, if they're not if they're not uh, required just at that moment. But it's just being mindful of that um, because it can be distracting and uh, the dog, you know, is doing valuable work. So it's, it's important not to distract them. So I thought it would just take a bit of time just go through some guidance that we have got um just about websites and documents um so i suppose for get uh, um documents and things like that um it's important that it's as easy to read as possible and i suppose good practice here is about not underlining so underlining uh, can make things uh, more difficult so it's just not underlining so if, if you need to highlight something it's maybe doing it um in bold or it may be using a different color um, but again it's about that color contrast so if it's on a white page and um, you know the likes of black writing um, with maybe if you needed to under, uh, highlight something so using maybe a, a, a dark red or um, trying to think uh, even you know like a maybe a green that sort of thing or if it's a um, you know there's if it's a green background, say, then there's no point using um, maybe a darker green because that contrast wouldn't be strong enough. So it's about using your black again, black writing or red writing. So it's it's just keeping keeping it, um, that if somebody does have a visual impairment, that they can still read, clearly read the, the text or see the, the symbols or the, the images. All caps as well can be very, very difficult for somebody with a learning disability to read. Um, so it's about not using all caps at all and just keeping to the to the, the normal uh, sentence case. And again, italics as well can be very difficult to read. So it's about avoiding italics if possible and just sticking with the, the, the uh, anything that needs to be um, differentiated, something with uh, maybe making it bold. So it's about keeping language brief and to the point, and I think we've discussed that before, and also not using abbreviations. So I suppose um, also on the website or on social media, it's maybe having a wee bit of small text around or a section if possible on access provision. So you might have an automatic door or you might have level access. You might have an accessible toilet and um, you might have a hearing loop. It's just highlighting those, um, you know, and if you do have something that isn't isn't, you know, perfect, then it's maybe even highlighting that and saying, look, you know, um, for example, we don't have an automatic door, but if you ring the bell, we'll get we'll 
come out and, and open the door for you. So it's just about highlighting that. Um, and the, we do have uh, good practices, maybe even to have a wee access guide. So having it a wee bit of a document, having it at your reception counter on your website that people can download. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I suppose it's just it's just maybe having that that um, information in one document that can be easily found. Another thing that we have, and I mentioned before, were the storyboards, social stories. And um, so you'll see in the photograph here, and I'll send ex a better example to the Karen um, later. But we've just developed these um, in the last last um, few months. But for the venues, we have basically set out just all the tasks that might be needed to say go for the, the swimming. So the first thing might be arriving and paying. And you'll see there, it's just about having those symbols and an image of the reception. But the symbols and there's there's also a, a wee key in the back of it. So it's just highlighting the crowds that you will be, you know, you'll be exchanging money and there also might be loud noise. It also allows people to tick it off. So it might be somebody with a neurodiverse condition that they may want to tick it off to say it's completed. And um, so they know that they can go on to the next stage. And the next stage may be going to the changing rooms. And it's just again laying out that, you know, um, this is the change room, you'll change here. And then the third step could be the swim pool. Um, so it's just maybe highlighting that it may be a bit cooler. Um, you know what, you might have to shower beforehand. You might have to change into a swimming costume. Highlighting those. And um, if anybody's interested in developing these, we have a template made out um, through Canva. And if you have access to Canva or if you sign up, we can get these across to you. And it's just a matter of you putting in your own image and changing the text a bit. So if anybody wants those, please make contact with Karen and I'll get you the template. Um, I suppose uh, we um, create these through consultation with parents of children with autism. Uh, so uh, they they have been uh, just the main focus. They know exactly what will work for their child. So it's not that we have just went out in a whim and created these. They actually work and benefit people. So um, if and they're very plain design. Um, which which people wanted so and there's no point reinventing the wheel so if anybody wants wants uh, the template we'll get them to the, to it. And so there's then just a few other I suppose um, areas that I thought I'd take and um, just mention to people and again I will get we have developed a wee uh, guide and I'll send it through to Karen and can be sent out but all these links to these different guides um, are in the document so it, it, they're just in one space and can be easily got online so every uh, the Equality Commission and I have every customer accounts and they have an a, a, a long list of, of, of guidance documents that um, range from people who run cafes to organisations and um, to employers. So we can get that out to everybody and there's some great information on that um, and again some information that will bolster what we, we spoke about today. The JAM card, if anybody, ha I'm sure most people have heard of it. The JAM card is stands for Just a Minute. It's been created by the NOW group, um, as created by people with disabilities, who identified that they needed a discreet way just to tell people um, that they just maybe needed a few extra minutes to maybe pay for something to change, whatever that may be. Um, and it's just a simple wee card that they produce. And I suppose it's just about maybe making staff aware that somebody may produce this card and what to do. Um, and the council at the moment have free online training um, available to small businesses and um, community groups, organisations, charities, um, and it, it, it's free. So um, if anybody would like um, any spaces for that and um, please just make contact and we will get you access it's very straightforward to do and um, you sign up very quickly and um, and it's maybe a wee 10 minute um we course just to make you aware a wee bit about disability awareness and then about the card itself and then you get a certificate as well that you can you can um display uh, just say that you're you're aware and you're jam card friendly and I suppose it's just 
then also acknowledge that a lot of things that maybe help support people with disabilities also support older people um, who may have acquired disability. Um, so I suppose it's just being aware that um, that there's also organisations out there to help um, with older people. So if there's anything that you're doing that might support older people and things like that, South Swift Age, Age Partnership um, are the, the network for older people within the Fermanagh Noble District Council area and Alison Forbes um, manages that and um, if there's any information or anything that you want to share out or anything that Alison's um, always very very helpful. So I suppose I think that is me and um, I know that's a very quick whistle tour of, of it. Um, but I suppose if anybody has any questions and I suppose just to even say um, that uh, a lot of the stuff today has been more, I suppose, very things that can be done in the short term. But there's obviously things as well um, in the long term, whether it's maybe physical changes and things like that. Um, and if anybody wants any more information on that or has any question or anything that, that they don't want to ask today, please feel free to give me a call or drop me an email and um, if I can help. I certainly will, and if, if if I can't, I'll definitely sign post to the the most relevant person. Um, so just Perfect. like to say thank you for listening. I hope I have bored you too much. Thank you very much, Matthew. That's great. Um, folks, I'd just like to add to 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 Matthew's there, and I'm gonna put a link into the chat. Um, Visit Britain have actually just in the last week or two, um, um published a toolkit on accessibility and inclusivity in tourism. Um, so again, I'll touch on a lot of the stuff that Matthew has highlighted for us here today. Um, and it just again has practical to toolkits that you can use in your business. Um, so if nothing else, it's very good as a reference guide and it would reinforce a lot of what um, Matthew said there. Um, and I think one of the key things is it's, you know, that um, accessible tourism and inclusivity, it's not, um, uh, you know, it's a right, it's not, um, you know, what's the other what's the you know uh, you know it's not a nice to have it's a right that people should be able to travel and should be able to access areas um and it's doing as matthew said what you can um and i think the the key thing for me matthew that i would take from that is that awareness and making your staff aware and, and communicating what you can and can't facilitate i suppose and you know letting um people then make the decision whether they can come um, and stay with you or you know enjoy an activity with you or an experience or whatever it is so it's about that kind of awareness and communication piece um, so as I say I'm going to put that into the um, link and um, certainly I would encourage you to take you up on Matthew's um, Matthew has so much information in this area and does a lot of great work so if anybody does want further information or like those training courses um, I would also direct you as well to the Global Sustainable Tourism Council um, which I suppose is the global body looking after sustainable council and they actually run a course specifically on accessibility and inclusivity in tourism at the moment and um, I think they run it about twice a year um, and that's it's a really good opportunity because you're learning from um, providers right across the world in terms of things they're doing and adopting into their business and um, and again it's a shared learning um opportunity so I will I'll drop something of that into the chat as well um so I'm going to drop them in now I suppose if there's any questions just um maybe there's not um, hello Karen can I speak go ahead yes is that you Sean I'd like to thank Matthew there for a good presentation there and I listened to another one there by Ashley there at one o'clock was was a brilliant presentation too but there's there's a lot there's a lot to take in and and Matthew knows I'm working on this for a long time um, and and Ray Noma and at Gordon Glen Forest Park. But how do we how do we get people now to get these things actions taken for making the like the Gordon Glen Forest Park more accessible for everybody? Like I've got a vision impairment myself, but um, it's not that reason. But a lot of people contact me through my Facebook page, Gordon Glen Forest Park page, and um, they're telling me they can't walk around the, the, the lower part of the park because of slopes and different other issues. Another thing was the change in place um, the room. Um, after today, could it be clarified um, that the one Gorge and Glen Forest Park is, as a change in place was always not classified as a change in place because it's not on, on some company in England. But maybe I'm wrong um, that today showed a, a, a diagram today with no share. So, a change in place room 
doesn't have to have a share. They recommend every share. Is that right, Matthew? Yeah, so if I maybe take the change in place facility first, Sean. So um yes, the okay, yeah. the change in place I suppose um everybody probably be aware um change in place is has to be twelve meters squared, I think it is our um uh, floor uh, size so that that there's enough room for uh, for navigating it. Um, it also has to have uh, an adult size changing bench, a hoist, and um, various other pieces of equipment before it can be uh, used. I suppose it's for people who you know need assistance when uh, to change, so it allows maybe carers or family members to support that uh, individual. Um, again, if anybody wants any information on that, surely we can get them information. Them and I know Sean. Um, as you said, there's a number of council facilities and non-council facilities, and um, that have these. Um, they're growing, and I suppose now legislation, building control regulations, now for new bills, particular are some new bills, it depends on size and things like that, and um, a number of visitors are legally required to have them if they're if they're being developed now at this stage, um, and um, there's definitely more coming up they don't require a shower um but they have to be a particular size and that one in gorton glens sean isn't the correct size just because it's a retrofit so it's been put into a building you know an old building um so it can't be classified as a change in place facility but it can you know i think it, the, the term is something like it's a change in facility with change in place equipment sean um yeah. See the see the the time the the revamped um, the forest park that that was accessible toilet, and then mm -hmm. somebody then campaigned for for a change of places you're aware, but the toilet was the share was in for like a mountain bikers and other people to to use that share. So now there's no share in Gorson Glen Forest Park, and the mountain bikers are look the mountain they're looking for a share or after they use their you no know, the mountain biking trails. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible, would it be something available now, listen to all these great presentations that have a, 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 like a, one of the modules um, and have it up beside the, the classroom? Because the classroom is well used by schools. Um, there is no there is no toilet up there, no water, but there is water supply there and, and, and sewage. If there's a module put there as a change in place uh, for everybody, everybody to use, and then reuse that in an accessible toilet and put a share into it because I've heard some great presentations today but uh, we need we need action to, to make the, the forest park as one of the top visitor attractions now accessible for all users like the people that can use mountain bike trails and all but people want to come and just walk around the lower park go to the play park go to the deers to make the park more accessible so if there was money available to put a, a module that'd be great Matthew thank you I suppose on that, Sean, um, I don't have any control over the, the Gorson Glens, as you know, mm -hmm. Sean, but um, but it's something that can be raised and uh, with the, the people who do. Um, so definitely it's something we can we can examine and see and explore what, what the options are. I don't know if I can for two seconds. Uh, Sean, I didn't know, I wasn't aware there was no share in the replacement toilets. No, but it's so at the next meeting I'll certainly back you up on my call for a module. Thank you, Dermot. Thank you for that um question and for responding, Matthew. Is there anyone else that has anything they'd like to add? We've all covered Matthew, you see. Great job. Or is um, this a sleep better? <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, look at you have um, our details and from the invitation, you're more than welcome um, to contact us at Tourism Development at FermanaOma.com or also at Matthew Nevin at Matthew Nevin, <laughs> Matthew Nevin at FermanaOma.com either. Um, if you have any further queries, um, this will certainly not be the last of us um, visiting this topic and um, sharing this topic with um, specifically, I suppose, from our point, the tourism industry. Um, 
um, as, there, as there's much work to do. Um, but I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and as I say, we're just open to any questions and to um, conversation. Sorry, Mary, you're going to come in there with a question, are you? No? No, it's not. Sorry okay. about that. I was just <laughs> going to say thank you very much, Matthew. It was very good, very informative. Yeah. Very Thank useful you. to know because we forget that sometimes when someone does come up to a desk or to or even on the phone, you know, you, you have to sometimes speak clearly and listen and all the rest of it. So it's good to be reminded every now and again of these things. Very important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. OK, folks, so we'll um, finish off with that. And as I say, just feel free to contact us if needed. And thank you again, Matthew. And thank you all for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for watching, Karen. Thanks, Ray. Bye Take now. care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.